everyone, welcome to my channel RPG Retro Reviews. I'm Captain Courageous and I review old school modules and games and try to give them a fun and informative analysis. This week I'm taking my Wayback Machine to 1987 with a look back at DA4 The Duchy of Ten. This is my final review on the DA series and I hope you've enjoyed my retrospective on this interesting moment in D&D history. For this final review, I'm going to delve a bit more into the goings-on at TSR Hobbies during the time of the module's publication. And stay tuned to the end of the video as I will also be giving my overall feelings on the entire series as well. Just a quick spoiler warning, I will be giving away the entire plot of this module, so if you intend on playing it, you may wish to direct your DM to this video and come back later. Otherwise, let's get started. Before I delve into the actual contents of DA4 The Duchy of Ten, let's briefly take a look at what was happening with TSR Hobbies. Now, much has been said about this time period in the company, especially by the people who were there, and depending on who you talk to, stories may vary, sometimes when told by the same people, decades apart, so I will try to keep any speculation on my part to a minimum. What is known is that Gary Gygax had somewhat mended fences with Dave Arneson, at least enough to entice him back to TSR for this project, but before it could even get underway, Gygax was unceremoniously forced out of TSR in 1985. Installed in his place was businesswoman Lorraine Williams, who herself had been hired by Gygax in 1984. Gygax had returned from his stint in Hollywood, where he was attempting to get a D&D &D movie started. The most notable project to result from his efforts was the highly successful Dungeons & Dragons cartoon. Upon his return to Lake Geneva, the home of TSR headquarters, he found TSR near financial ruin due to the Bloom Brothers' financial mismanagement of the company during his absence. Immediately, Gygax got to work. The long-delayed Temple of Elemental Evil was assigned to Frank Menser. One ED&D's first major rules expansions, Unearthed Arcana and Oriental Adventures, were rushed to print with minimal playtesting. And the classic super modules, Scourge of the Slave Lords and the Queen of the Spiders were released, and along with Temple of Elemental Evil became Dungeons & Dragons first super campaign. All of this generating much needed sales revenue and getting TSR out of the financial pit it had dug for itself. In turn, the Blooms sold their shares of TSR stock to Lorraine Williams, thus giving her controlling interest in the company. How all of this affected Arneson's relationship with TSR is primarily speculation, but Williams' adversarial relationship with those at TSR, especially those associated with Gary Gygax, is well documented, and according to TSR luminary Jim Mord, as well as Arneson himself, have both said that Williams didn't want those associated with Gygax to have anything to do with TSR, and with the ending of TSR's original era, so too went the Blackmore series of modules. At least one other module was planned, DA5 City of Blackmore, which is rumored to have been completed by Dave Ritchie, and the way things are worded in DA4, Duchy of Ten, the DA series was definitely intended to be an ongoing series well past even that. As for this final module in the series, there is a significant amount of world building in particular, more so than with the previous three, and it makes great use of that cool map from the first module, Adventures in Blackmore, with the nondescript names finally given context and purpose, and an easy-to-follow gazetteer-style format. Out of the four modules produced, the last one really seems to find its groove with a classic fantasy quest-style adventure that truly shows the potential in what running an ongoing Blackmore campaign could be like and plays to its strengths. Of note, the very excellent Gazetteer 1, the Grand Duchy of Karamikos, the first known world campaign supplement, had been released only six months before, and its influence seems apparent here as the massive unbroken exposition dumps from the previous modules in this series are mostly gone, with information parceled out and organized in manageable chunks. Furthermore, this adventure has it all. 
a dangerous voyage at sea followed by a hazardous trek overland through enemy-infested territory, an alliance with the rebellion in the Duchy of Ten, and a powerful artifact, the Well of Souls, orchestrated by the mind of the evil immortal Zugzul himself, and then implemented through the vessel of his beautiful high priestess, Tosca Rosa. This module introduces the concept of immortals in the D&D campaign and how they are portrayed in the known world. D&D Set 5, The Immortals Rules, had been introduced only the year prior to this module's release. And finally, the Blackmore series delves into detail on the savage hillmen from the Northlands of Goblin Cush, the Afridi, the Children of Fire, and their patron immortal, Zagzul. The Goblin Kush is a frigid land that breeds a particularly hardy warrior cast of people. Fire is paramount to survival here, and thus they worship the god who gifted it to them, Zugzul the One. In truth, Zugzul, like most immortals, was once mortal himself, and through the path of the Paragon ascended to immortality. The D&D Master set of rules goes into great detail on how immortals are created. But briefly, there are five spheres of influence that make up all of creation. Time, thought, matter, energy, and entropy. There are four heroic paths to immortality that mortals can follow. The path of the Dynas for time, the path of the epic hero for thought, the path of the paragon for energy, and the path of the polymath for the sphere of matter. A mortal must first capture the attention of an existing immortal to sponsor them in their chosen sphere, and then complete the four following accomplishments. One, reach their maximum level in their chosen class. Two, they must complete a quest for the sphere. Three, a trial. And then four, a testimony. Once immortality is achieved, the immortal must work towards expanding the influence of their chosen sphere. In the case of Zigzul, he has chosen to influence the Afridi in dreams over centuries, slowly creating a matriarchal society in which the high priestess is considered his literal bride and her words and commands are considered to be his directly. All of this culminates with the ascension to power of the beautiful high priestess Tosca Rosa. Through her, the Afridi people are marshaled into a massive army that descends in a ruthless conquering host upon the southern lands, thus releasing a significant amount of chaos and energy upon the world. All was going quite well. The Afridi's forces began a seven-year campaign southward, conquering and wreaking havoc upon each land it encountered and learning battle tactics from the people they conquered, becoming more and more formidable. The Duchess of the Peaks surrendered outright, though the Duchy of Ten put up quite a fight but ultimately fell to the Afridi onslaught, who then set its sights on the decadent lands of the Empire of Thalnia, far to the south. Between them, however, stood the lands of Blackmore. The barons in that hard land had put out a call to the decadent empire of Thonia for aid against the impending invasion, but their pleas fell on deaf ears. Desperate, the barons led a rebellion against the empire and installed their leader, Uther Andahar, as their king. It was the forces of Blackmore that finally put the brakes on the Afridi onslaught and dealt them their first real defeat and thus Zagzul began sending instructions for the creation of an army-defeating artifact that would once more allow the Afridi conquest of the southern lands to continue. Tuscarosa began work on the evil artifact, the Well of Souls, being constructed on a sacred hill known to the Afridi as Tor Karam, or the Hill of the Hammer. The exact location of said hill, unknown except that it resides within the barons of Karsh in the Duchy of Ten. Blackmore's chief spymaster, the Fetch, learns that the Afridi are busy making something of great power, as its construction was creating ripples in the fabric of magic, and his intelligence-gathering efforts uncover the writings of a magic user involved in the artifact's creation. Through that, he learns that the evil artifact has a weakness, of course, as is the way of such things. The Well of Souls can only be unmade by the hands of those not yet born, which, given the time travel nature of the player character's arrival in Blackmore, literally means they are the only ones who can destroy the artifact. Throughout this entire series, I've been kind of annoyed at the ease of access to time travel by the Fetch and his secret Blackmore spy network. And here, in this module, finally, there is at least a great storyline reason for it. 
The Fetch is both amused and horrified upon learning about the artifact. Amused because his employ are heroes that meet the very requirements for the artifact's destruction, and horrified at what it will mean if Tuscarosa is allowed to complete the creation of her army-killing machine. The heroes must act here, or all they know of in the future will be unmade, as well as the fall of Blackmore if the Well of Souls is not destroyed. Amusingly, the module still has the PCs negotiating with the Fetch about how much gold they will take for the mission, which to me is a bit silly, given the setup. If the PCs don't accept this quest, they are going to essentially die or become undone as time and space are rewritten by the artifact. I know that PCs are a mercenary lot, but seriously, if one's continued existence isn't motivation enough to accept the mission, what's the point of gold? The quest begins with the introduction of skilled sea captain and smuggler Hieronymus Castigier and his vessel the Blossom, which the heroes will use to navigate from Blackmoor along the Amber Channel to the Duchy of Ten Port City of Robinsport. From there, the journey continues in a trek overland through dangerous terrain and a massive army of the Afridi to Tor Karam, where the heroes must uncover the Well of Souls in a climactic final battle with Afrit and Soul Eaters in an effort to destroy Tuscarosa's vile artifact once and for all. It's a fantastic fantasy premise, and David Ritchie does a great job of breaking each part down into digestible chunks that the DM can easily manage. Each section of the journey is given its own random encounter chart. There is a great roster of NPCs to interact with and an entire section of plot twists the DM can choose to introduce into the narrative. Events for the Voyage of the Blossom, the visit to Robinsport, and the overland journey are carefully described here, and rather than the massive walls of unbroken texts, it is given headers and bold types so the DM can navigate easily through this adventure. Rather than provide a map for the city of Robinsport, the concept of the chase flowchart is introduced. Here, each location is assigned a letter which corresponds to a particular business or landmark, and each letter assigned a circle on the flowchart, so the relationship between each is clearly represented. It's actually a pretty clever device to use as a stand-in to represent any large city without the need for the DM to create a detailed map. There is a very cool plot twist section, and it has each plot point numbered with three headers, a precondition, if any, a brief description of what potentially can happen, and the mechanics of what's involved. The DM decides what story elements to introduce into the adventure as needed. Potential plot twists involve everything from an unexpected romantic interest to a betrayal of the party by Captain Castigier to the sinking of the Blossom and rescue by Skandaharan raiders during their overseas trek to Robinsport. Thus, no two DMs will run this adventure the same way, and the number of potential outcomes are nearly infinite, thus preventing the rather straightforward quest of travel to the artifact and destroy it from being a by-the-numbers linear affair. There are some very interesting monsters and NPCs introduced as well, such as the Sullux, a race of seven-foot-tall humans with crimson skin that reside on the prime material plane. They are related to the Afrit, which are their mortal enemies, who they've tried to drive from the prime material plane for generations. A Solix that has defeated an Afrit in battle can join the Brotherhood of the Sun. It is possible that one of these Sun Brothers may wish to join the PCs on their quest to Tor Karam to destroy the Well of Souls. The Soul Eaters are creatures from another dimension that can be summoned by a high-level cleric or granted by an immortal to slay their enemies. Soul Eaters reside in the Well of Souls and will spring forth in its defense when the PCs attack. The engaging cover art for this module is by legendary TSR artist Clyde Caldwell and depicts a sea voyage of some type which does actually take place in the module at least. Interior artwork is by Dave Dorman and cartography by Dennis Koth and Dave Sutherland. As with other modules in this series, eBay prices are rather expensive with quality copies, going for hundreds of dollars or more. Drive -through RPG has the PDF for only $5, and it's an excellent scan. 
Unfortunately, like others in the series, it is not yet available for print on demand. So let's go ahead and take a look at DA4, the Duchy of 10, on my D20 scale of style, presentation, and value. Style-wise, this continues with the mid-80s classic trade dress. Clyde Caldwell's cover art is quite good, and unlike Adventures in Blackmoor and City of the Gods, actually depicts a scene in the module. But the interior art is near non-existence. It's not until page 41 that the first real interior art is encountered, and then several more pieces to go along with the NPC descriptions. However, on page 46, there is a breathtaking piece of the Blossom crashing on some rocks, which could be a Clyde Caldwell piece. I doubt it's from Dave Dorman. The map work here also varies greatly. The maps of the Blossom and the Forge at Torkaram dungeon maps are decent enough, but the topography maps of Torkaram itself is atrocious, stuffed nearly unreadable into the corner of page 21. Given its importance to the story and the full page maps from the City of the Gods, one would think this would have at least been given as much care. Map 5, Dagaran's Ambush, also received shoddy treatment as well. I'll rate this a 14. Presentation for the Duchy of 10 is a tenfold improvement over the previous modules, though the beginning chapter does delve into massive exposition dumps as per the previous three adventures. However, once things get started, each chapter of the module is divided into organized, digestible chunks. While I can't say for certain, it seems that the fingerprints of the just-released Gazetteer series had a positive influence on presentation style that greatly improves the flow of the adventure, skillfully breaking up the mostly linear storyline of travel to the forge and destroy the evil artifact by introducing twists and turns to keep players on their toes. In my opinion, this makes the Duchy of Ten the best out of the four released Blackmore modules. I'll rate this an 18. Finally, for value, the collectability of the module makes its acquisition a pricey affair, though the PDF is obviously easy to afford. If this is ever released as a print-on-demand product, my rating here would be a bit higher, but for now I'll rate this a 16. That brings my overall rating for DA4 the Duchy of Ten to a 16, very good. I hope you all have enjoyed this retrospective look back at this series of modules based on the original D&D campaign. If I were to run this today, I'd dispense entirely with the comeback in time travel plot device and substitute some other random seeming event, one that possibly happens when the heroes are still mid-level, which will make the weakness of the Well of Souls reveal all that more impactful. I'd also substitute entirely the City of the Gods adventure, with the Zeitgeist Games version. To me, these modules really represent a peek at the sea change in the direction of TSR at the time. The last of the old guard was gone, or would soon be leaving. Gary Gygax, Dave Arneson, Rob Kuntz, Jim Ward, and Frank Menser, to name a few, those that had literally created the hobby, and for good or ill, a new era was beginning. The DA series of modules were a victim of this change, getting cancelled just as it seems it was catching its stride. However, a new group of creative minds would get a chance to make their own mark on the game and the hobby we love. Bruce Hurd, Ed Greenwood, Aaron Alston, for example, and the next few years would see the release of the entire Gazetteer series, and in 1989, Advanced D&D would see its first major re revision with the release of the second edition of the game. Still to come were some amazing supplements, Ravenloft, Spelljammer, and the Ruins of Undermountain, just to name a few. It's certainly interesting to speculate what if and how things might have been different if Gary Gygax had retained control of the company he created. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you found this review informative and useful. I have used some of that sweet affiliate money and purchased the print-on-demand copy of Mutant Future from Goblinoid Games, so I'll have that for you coming up later this week. Blizzard Entertainment at BlizzCon Online recently announced that they will be releasing a remaster of the classic Diablo 2 video game. As such, I thought it might be fun to take a look back at Diablo 2 supplements that were released for the AD&D game some 20 odd years ago. As usual, I'd like to give a big shout out to all my wonderful patrons and your continued support makes these videos possible. If you enjoyed this module review, please give it a like, comment, and share. 
follow me on Twitter, and join the channel's Facebook page, Dungeons & Dragons RPG Reviews. Consider supporting the channel and more content like this by becoming a patron yourself. Alternatively, you can just leave a tip in my PayPal tip jar. Links for everything is in the description. And as always, my friends, may your d20 roll true and game on. <laughs>